Hi, I'm Tony Todd, and welcome to Throwing Heat. I'm here with my two co-hosts, Dr. Dan Ratner and Ross the Boss. Today's guest is someone I've always looked up to. We are both born and raised in the city of Santa Monica, California, and after high school, he became a professional baseball player and a color commentator for the Arizona Diamondbacks and the Detroit Tigers. Let's welcome to the show, my buddy, Rod Allen. What's up, Rod? Hey, what's going on, fellas? Thanks for having me. I've watched uh, some of you guys work, and you guys do an unbelievable job. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for joining us, Rod. Sir, I've been listening to you for many years um, with Detroit and the Arizona Diamondbacks, and you always do a great job. Yeah. Well, thank so, you for saying that, man. That's a wonderful gig, man, to be a big league broadcaster. Uh, is amazing, especially some of the teams that I was able to cover. Right. So, Rod, I'm going to take you way back now. Uh, How far are you going to go back? We're going to go back like hair grease, all right? So, um, <laughs> Tell us, tell us what it was like growing up in Santa Monica in the 70s, Rob. Oh, my goodness. Uh, it was unbelievable. But you really don't realize how nice it is, TT, until you go back as an adult. When we grew up as children, and we just took it for granted that, you know, we could go to Memorial Park and we could play basketball and football and, and do all the things that we did and have all the mentors that we had in our life. It's not that way everywhere in the country. We were so fortunate. And not only that, to have the diversity that we had at our schools, you know? So that was wonderful too, because you got integrated to a lot of different people. We went to Malibu, we were in Hollywood, we were all over the place. Santa Monica was heaven. And all my friends that go back there that I played with in professional baseball, they called me spoiled and they're absolutely right. I mean, growing up there was unbelievable. The beach was four blocks from the high school mm -hmm. uh, and, and just the mentors that we all had in our lives. I know I'm a little older than you, Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, I don't think we could have grew up in a better place than Santa Monica, California. Right. And I would always tell my friend Ross that because Ross, you know, he attended Beverly Hills High School. But <laughs> we had we had guys we had guys in the neighborhood that we can all look up to yourself, Stanley Younger, you know, uh, 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 Kevin Reynolds, you know, Cliff Webb, Mike Tennant. And, you know, as being in elementary school, we would always look forward to, you know, we had to go watch our heroes. You guys were our heroes. And. <laughs> And, 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 you know, in 76, I think you guys made history, you know, that American Legion team, and we may have a photo of it, but I mean, just, you know, th there it is right there. Can you tell us about that team right there? What year was, I mean, that looks like, like 1855, you're looking for like somebody's <laughs> wanted in the wild west, you're trying to find that person. That photo is old. I'll right. tell you one thing about that photo. We were all a little angry because that year. Uh, we lost uh, in the CIF uh, championship game uh, mm -hmm. to uh, Shafee High School, I believe it was. Anthony Munoz was a pitcher for that team. And we started our ace, Tim Leary, in that game. And then we took him out. We brought in somebody else, and we lost that game. And we knew we were the best team in California that year by far. So we assembled the same cast of characters for a summer league team, and it was our American Legion team. And we balled out, and we made it all the way to the College World Series. We won the whole thing. And that was big because you were playing against teams all over the country, all over the country. As a matter of fact, in the final game in Manchester, New Hampshire, we went up against Mike Boddicker. Mike Boddicker went on to be an outstanding big league pitcher for the Baltimore Orioles. But I got a hit in that game. Stanley Younger got a hit. I scored the run. And that was the only run in the game. And we won that game. So it was just special growing up in Santa Monica. There were so many gifted, talented players. It was unbelievable. And the high school was tremendous, too. I spoke to Tim recently. He told me like there's like 18 of the 25 guys there. Like we see like division one scholarships or division two from that team. Is that true? Oh yes. Everybody on that team uh, went on to play college baseball, college football uh, in some capacity. Of course, I got to the big leagues. Uh, Tim Leary got to the big leagues. It's hard to get to the big leagues, let alone get signed uh, to a professional contract. But uh, we had a wonderful team led by uh, Tom McCaffrey, who's still a really good friend of mine. He's one of the reasons why I am here today. I mean, to be honest with you, he was really hard on me in high school and made sure I stayed on that straight and narrow path because he could see talent in me before I could see talent in myself. And that's usually the way it is with an adult when you have a child or, or, t or, 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 or a young man that you're coaching that might not necessarily make all the right decisions. And I wasn't a saint in high school, uh, but I got through it. But he's one of the reasons why I did get through it. I think that's such an important point, Rod, because, and I, we say this to many different athletes and all kinds of types that we talk to, it's really, a lot of it is about your mindset about you, your belief system about you, and that's one of the things I'm hearing is special about Santa Monica. So I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, where we were the mm -hmm. butt of national jokes for a while. I don't care <laughs> oh, at all. I, I love it here. But it did wear on my psyche. And if you're in Santa Monica and you've got adults who believe in you, 
they fed you they fed you the right mental information, and that helped you no, get where you got. And there's no doubt about that. And, and like for instance, Tony, I mean, I grew up on Cloverfield, uh, right there on you know Cloverfield and and, and uh, drawn a, a right by the park there. And, and Tony grew up, I mean, probably five blocks from me. I know exactly where he lives today. And uh, not only that, he talked about all the mentors. I had mentors too, and Dennis Thurman and Ainsley Washington and, and Anthony Williams, who was a pitcher, and, and Terry Bevington, who went on to play big league baseball and also managed Chicago White Sox. It was all about a mentorship. And we also had a gentleman in our neighborhood. His name was John Rossi. Mm-hmm. And he worked at a local Ford dealer. And he just took a laser white guy. And he just took a liking to all the African-American kids in the community. And he started this youth center. And we had a place to go after school. We could do our homework. When we turned 14 and 15, he gave us jobs. He was really monumental. A lot of our a lot of our kids youth growing up. And he 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 got us all the sports and different things like that. He got me into pump pass and kick, Mm -hmm. you know, where I was real good at that. I mean, we Santa Monica was off the chain. It really was. I mean, I have no complaints about the way that I grew up. And I had that photo, the John Rossi photo, but I didn't get it in in time. But you know, one of one of Ross's buddies was on that team, Naaman Thompson. I showed yeah. him the photo. You know, you remember Naaman, right, Ross? Oh, absolutely. I, I love yeah. Naaman. Yeah, yeah. He's an unbelievable yeah. athlete. Yeah. He still looks good. I saw him recently. He's unbelievable. Yeah. So, uh, was so, special. so Rod, you were drafted in '77 by the White Sox. Yeah. Uh, and you you got some money. And yeah, we'll the rumor take, we'll, is that you bought a car with it. Is there any rumor? Is that rumor true? Somebody told me that. I don't know if that's a true story. And tell me what kind of car it was and what color it was. You know, one of the things that I did not have the luxury of having was a mom and dad that could afford to buy me a car when I was in high school. So even though I was a star athlete, I mean, one of the best players on the baseball team, obviously, I'd be walking to school, catching the buses. All my buddies had cars, but my parents could not afford a car for me. So it's, when I signed my professional contract, I went out and bought me a Buick Regal. And it was canary yellow. And then I put some rims on it. And then I just took it to a whole nother level. It was so clean. Uh, uh, it, it was amazing. But I bought it myself with my own That's great. Money, my own hard dollars that I earned for, for my money. I think back then I paid $5,000 for that car. You know, and that was 1977. But I'll tell you something else about 77, only because I saw your first guest in Tim Rain. Um, and Tim and I, you both drafted in 77. He was fifth round Expo, sixth round White Sox. But we stayed in the same motel in Sarasota, Florida. So I got a chance to, to know Tim Raines really young. He got to the big leagues in 79, and the rest is history. But it uh, just goes how small the circle is that we have in baseball. This fraternity is awfully special. What was it like when you did get drafted? Tell us, what was the excitement level? You know, it, it's different than it is today. I mean, I knew I was going to get drafted because I had all the – Scouts were coming to my home and they were giving me the eye test and all those kinds of things. And every time that we would play, I would notice there would be 15, 20 scouts in the stands and all the guys on the team. But I'd say they're here to watch you play. And so I talked to quite a few of them. But the one guy that I never really talked to, but I saw him in all the games, his name was Gary Johnson. And he turned out to be a really good friend of the family. He was uh, from uh, Irvine uh, and he was a White Sox scout. But he was the one that drafted me. And he said the reason why he didn't talk to me, he said he didn't want anybody else to know that he liked me as much as he liked me. Uh, but we went on to be really good friends. We'd send Christmas cards to one another. Uh, he's gone on to uh, to be with the Lord these days. But uh, that's how I got drafted. But we were playing an American Legion game that day. And I don't know who had a phone. We didn't have cell phones back then. But about halfway through the game, my manager came over to me, Todd McCaffrey, said, you've just been drafted by you know the White Sox in the sixth round. Guys gave me oh, a wow. big old hug. And then we just started playing to finish the baseball game. You know, you that's win? the way it was. And you won I the game. Probably- we probably did. We were tight in Santa Monica. I mean, we didn't lose too many games. We didn't lose too many games. Speaking of, of teams that didn't lose too many games, you played for the Detroit Tigers in 1984. Oh, oh my God. Uh, talk about what that was like they, when they won it all. Oh, my God. First of all, it, it, it was an unbelievable spring for me because I didn't even go to spring training on the Major League roster. I had just signed as a six-year free agent. I had been the previous year with Seattle. So I knew no one in Detroit. I wasn't there the first day of spring training, but I showed up about two weeks in the spring because they always brought in players. They didn't want to put you in the hotel. They didn't want to pay you money, but they wanted to see you. So they brought me down early. They put us in the minor league side and we all got in shape. And one day we were playing a game and I think I hit a ball about 500 feet. And the next day, Sparky Anderson wanted to see me. So I went over on the other side of the street and I played in a game. Sparky put me in there, batted me fifth. I think I got a couple of knocks that day. 
went back the next day. Then I didn't go back for three or four more days. Then I started going every day. And then everybody started to see, man, you, you're going to make this team somehow, some way. Somehow a guy from Santa Monica, California, that wasn't even in spring training, hmm. left that year on the Detroit Tigers and was on the team to go 35-5. and five. So it was awfully special uh, just to be around guys like Chet Lemon and Lou Whitaker and Sparky Anderson was a genius and Kurt Gibson was a warrior and Trammell and Parrish. Uh, just so many special, special players. And I had a chance to play with those guys. And they didn't even know me. When I left there, like May 20th or May you know, 30th, I got sent down to the minor leagues. I didn't know half those guys. That's just how fast it was. But, you know, I've got the World Series ring on right here, my 84 Tigers World Series ring. And it's awfully special to me. I've got a few of these rings, but this is the one that I wear the most because this is the one that I work the hardest for. But just to make that team and be a part of that, and then to parlay that into 17 years in the broadcast booth is remarkable. That, Rod, that's great. You know, one of the funniest clips, I know you get embarrassed <laughs> by it, but I'm bringing it up. Ross the Boss brings it up. And this is, for me, this is comedy. I've, I'm from the comedy world, and I, I love this clip. I think we showed it even on the Tonight Show when I was working there. Now, you were you were playing in Japan. Why, yeah, why, don't, you, yeah. why don't you set it up, and we're going to show it. But, but but the thing about this clip is we see a close-up of the Japanese pitcher's face and he sees terror coming at him. He sees terror and you see it in the clip. It's unbelievable. Um, what, what, Rod, why don't you set it up and then we'll show it. Don't, ro- don't roll it. Let me set it up. Thank All you. right, we were playing in Yokohama in, in, in Japan and the pitcher on the mound, his name was Diamond. And I was having an unbelievable day. I think I had homered off the scoreboard. I doubled, had another single when I was on second base. My previous at bat. And it was a base hit, and then I ran the catcher over. But I didn't really run him over. I just gave him a little forearm shiver. Not much. Tony, you know I didn't like football. I didn't like – I like baseball. So, you know, I just gave him a little shiver. And then, you know, my next time up, I told Mike Young, who was the other American on the team. There's only two Americans on the team. I knew they were going to throw at me. I just knew it because of the way they reacted after I ran the catcher over to score the run. All right, so the next time I get up and I go to the plate, now you can run it. And Diamond throws the baseball, and he throws it behind me. He misses me. And then they try to get to that. They always try to get to their first baseline. They try to get to their dugout. So you see, I cut him off, and I turned him up field, and then it was on. I look like a young Jim Brown chasing them all over the field, man. But they love that in Japan, man. And that happened over 20 years ago, man. And they still play it everywhere, and people still love that. You see Mike Young, 49, right there? That was my buddy right there. It was only two of us. So, I mean, we're out there amongst all the Japanese players and there's two Americans and we decided to charge the mound. So really we could have just gotten beat up, but we did, you know, they kind of calmed things down. My interpreter, Mr. Mastermoto, he carried me off the field. I'm telling him, let me go, let me go. He said, come on, man, you've embarrassed yourself enough. But anyway, that did, was the one. Did, did you apologize? Did, I, I did ran you apologize catch- to Diamond after? You, it's, fun- I, it's funny, it's funny that nobody on that, team would talk to me for maybe we, we'd see them all the time and I was friends with those guys they always like to talk to the American players but no one on that team would talk to me until I, they hit me later on in the year and I went down to first base and then after that it was all good they were oh. buddy buddies again it's almost like they had to get you know redemption for that and I never hit anybody I didn't swing at anybody I really wasn't mad to be honest with you I just kind of knew he what he was going to do and in my mind, I'm saying, I got to go get him if he throws his ball at me. So, and that, that was funny. I mean, and it lives, uh, it lives today. It, it's oh, yeah. hilarious. And, and now, Rob, it was the only, talking? go ahead. All right. It was the only bench clearing brawl I've ever seen in center field. I just want to <laughs> say that. It's hilarious, man. The run down. And, and on top of that, man, I told you I was having a great day and it was hot in Yokohama. I had doubled, I had homework. I'm on the bases all day. It's AstroTurf. My legs were tired and I had to chase this boy all the way to center field. That's it's funny. funny. Now, Rod, when you were playing in Japan, did they did they still have uh, it's called fight pay? Is, is that the right yes. word? Yes, fight pay. As a matter as a matter of fact, the 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 the, the final part of this story is um, after this happened, you know, the next day, um, I, you know, my manager said they they uh, they find they didn't suspend you, but they find you a thousand dollars. First of all, first of all, when they call you into the fight money, say you guys are coaches, you guys are the three coaches, and you guys are sitting in the room, you guys are kind of forming the game plan for the day. And they call all the players one by one before the bus leaves to go to the ballpark to come into the room so they can give them the fight money. So they call me in. And what, before I can get in the door, all three of the coaches, I mean, they're just busting up laughing. They just look at me and they just laugh because of what I had did the night before. Then my manager, he told me that uh, through my interpreter, he said, well, they find you $1,000. 
but we're going to pay your fine. And they paid my fine and he gave me my fight money. And uh, <laughs> that that's kind of the way it ended. But my, my teammates just absolutely love that, man. It, it, it's so funny to this day. Rod, can you explain fight money to Ross and Dan? They may not understand what well, that is. Well, fight money is if you go out, if you're a pitcher and you have a really good day or you throw a shutout or you get a win, the next day your manager and the, the coaches – uh, they get their money together and they pay you fight money because basically you're helping them keep their jobs by you playing so well. And likewise for a position player, you homer, you double, you drive in big runs the next day, they give you fight money. So whenever you play well, you know, there was some years where I lived off fight money in Japan all year long because you got it every single day. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. I had no idea. Now, I mean, so you've been part of some some really successful uh, runs with the Tigers. You you were the broadcaster in Arizona when they won it all. They beat the Yankees, and I was so thankful for that moment because it was it was the second team that had been leading going into the bottom of the ninth in Game Seven and lost. Well, before that, it was the Indians with, against the Marlins. So, what was it? How did you get that job, and what was it like being there in that atmosphere? You know, I've been so blessed, man. I, you know, God has really taken care of me because I was on my path to be, uh, I thought, a big league manager. I was going to manage uh, one of the minor league teams in Arizona. Uh, and that's what my job was going to be until I met Tom Brenneman, who is a Cincinnati Red announcer, does a lot of football, became a really good friend of mine. And he was already hired by the Diamondbacks to be their broadcaster, even though they weren't going to start play for a couple of years. Jerry Colangelo got him from the Chicago Cubs the same way he got Buck Showalter from the New York Yankees. He wanted to make sure he had the best people in place, and he loved Tom Brenneman, and Colangelo was from Chicago, so he loved Tom. So anyway, to make a long story short, Bank One Ballpark, it's called Chase Field. Now, it wasn't even built at the time, and they were giving some of the employees a tour around the ballpark, and I was touring, and Tom Brenneman and I happened to have a conversation for about an hour just talking baseball, talking life, talking about a lot of different things. And at the end of the conversation, he asked me, he said, have you ever thought about being an announcer? And I said, no, I'm high school educated. Uh, you know, I don't know if I you know, speak well enough to be a broadcaster, if I can enunciate my words properly. I don't want to embarrass myself. He said, no, 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 no. He said, I think you could do it. So to make a long story short, he told Colangelo, he told some other people, they put the balls in motion. I did a couple of uh, uh, AAA games to audition, a couple of fall league games to audition. And I went from being a minor league manager to a big league broadcaster in a matter of two weeks. So that's how it happened for me. One guy I toured with, he loved my voice. He loved my energy. He loved my talent. He knew I knew baseball. And they were going to hire one minority guy. And I ended up being the minority that they hired because all the pieces kind of fell in place. So I'm very thankful for Tom Brenneman giving me that first opportunity. You know, you were in Arizona. You got to see Randy Johnson pitch in his prime. Yes. I mean, how how great was he? I mean, I, I saw him pitch many times, but you saw him pitch a lot. I mean, would you say he's the most dominating pitcher in 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 the 1900s? I mean, what what how what level do you put him on? He's up there. Uh, you know, I saw the cat win four straight Cy Youngs. I mean, and that's ridiculous. I mean, four straight Cy Youngs, and he's the only pitcher that I've ever seen where the best left-handers in the business they don't play. When he pitches, except Barry Bonds, Barry Bonds wasn't scared of him. But everybody else did not pitch. I mean, did not play left-handers against Randy Johnson. I don't care who you were. It was a day off for most left-handers. But, you know, to be that talented and just to watch him uh, go about his business and how intimidating that he was and, you know, how tall he was and lanky and, you know, throwing 100 miles an hour with a slider. And, you know, just he was intimidating. It was fun to watch. But I tell you what. Kurt Schilling was awfully fun to watch too, man, for about three years in Arizona because Randy was winning the Cy Young and Kurt Schilling was finishing second. So every fifth day, man, you had a chance to watch Schilling and Johnson. Now, I think both guys are pretty much in their primes at the time. So unbelievable watching Randy Johnson. I think he's probably the best pitcher that I've ever had a chance to watch on a day-to-day -day basis. And obviously Justin Verlander will be second. Well, I was going to ask, you know, you went to Detroit for 17 years and I wondered, yeah. you've, seen, you've seen a lot of games. Was was there is there a greatest play that you can remember? Anything cool. that to mind? There's a lot, you know. I, I think one of the best plays that I've watched in a uh, Comerica Park, and, and the people don't talk about it a lot because it didn't happen. It was a play that Austin Jackson made the very first out of the inning when Armando Galarraga was approaching, uh, throwing a perfect game, 
Uh, Grudzalonic led off the ninth and hit a ball to left center field, and Austin Jackson ran a mile to make that play. And then, of course, we all know what happened later on. Donaldson would hit the ground ball, and then Jim Joyce would call him safe when he was out. And right. then Armando Galarraga did not get the no-hitter or the perfect game. So, therefore, you don't see that Jackson catch as much right. as you should. But you Google – go back and, and Google that that Jackson catch after this is over and, and take a look at that catch. And I had a call on there that's one of my favorite calls of all, all times too. Uh, so, I'm a little biased for that one. But I watched Miggy win a triple crown. I watched Miggy win three batting titles. I watched Miggy win MVPs. I watched Scherzer uh, in Detroit, you know, for four yep. or five years. Verlander's no hitters and just his dominance. Pudge Rodriguez turned the organization around. For about eight or nine years there, I had the best analyst job in the country, as far as I'm concerned, with that much talent. David Price rolled through there. Gary Sheffield rolled through there. Dave Dombrowski, who was the architect of that team, he loved talent. He loved power pitching, and he loved guys that had swagger like Gary Sheffield and Craig Monroe and Curtis Granderson. We had a good team. Didn't win a world championship, unfortunately, but, man, those teams were tremendous. Who would Ron, who would you say is the best player in the league right now? Oh, man. I mean, it's easy to say Tatis, you know, um, but, you know, the boy in Atlanta is nice. Okunia, uh, you know, you got the other kid in, in Washington. Soto is a real good player. Uh, and that's not it, man. There's so many good players in baseball today. It's amazing the talent. I mean, DeGrom is pitching lights out when he's healthy. And I know I'm leaving a lot of people off the list, man, but there's just so many talented, gifted players in the game of baseball today. I, I can't give you too many, but those top three are, are nice lists to start with. I'm going to name just, I mean, Mike Trout obviously comes to mind. But, he's up there. He's up there. But well, no, o how about Otani? Otani? You mean yeah. Showtime? See, I didn't, yeah, I, when so you tough. say, when you, you, when you say best player in the game, he doesn't come to mind right away because this dude is kind of off the planet, man. You know what I'm saying? I mean, 23 homers now already, and he's throwing 100 miles an hour, <laughs> and he's fast as one on the team. And how do you do that? I mean, I've played the game, and I've watched the game for 30 years, and I've never seen anybody with this kind of skill set. And it just seems like he's hitting a homer every single day. And he's much he's must see TV. I mean, he's going to be the MVP if he stays healthy. There's no question about that. But what he is doing on a baseball field is nothing short of miraculous. You know, let, let's talk about all the all the press on the pitchers using illegal substances. I I want to get your take on that. I I know you've been in the game for a long time. You've seen everything. Yeah. And I mean, do you think it's a problem in Major League Baseball? The reason I think it's a problem. Is, is hitters are striking out 24% of the time. And that's a huge number. 24% of the time they strike out, not get out, but strike out. <laughs> so, I mean, something's going on. I mean, the ball's rotating a lot more than it used to. There's something going on. I just want to get your take, Rod. Hey, but boss, they get paid to strike out these days. They get paid to hit homers and strike out. I mean, that's just the way the game has evolved these days. I mean, when we came up as professionals, and even when I, when I taught as a hitting coach, right. you take two bunch, you move the guy over, you get a guy in, you hit a fly ball. These guys aren't thinking about that. They're lifting and separating on every single swing. Every single person is trying to hit a home run. That's one reason why the strikeouts are down. And the answer to your question, yes. I mean, the foreign substance that they were using obviously was helping pitchers take their game to a whole nother level. The batting average for hitters this year is the lowest it's ever been. And it's harder to hit a baseball now than it's ever been. And I think the reason is because you know, you have taken a lot of guys that were mediocre, or not mediocre, but good pitchers, and they've been, and now they're great pitchers. Guys' spin rates have really improved the RPMs. I mean, I don't want to bore your audience with all those analytics and numbers and different things like that, but it's clearly a problem, and it's already becoming a problem because now you're starting to hear, you know, pitchers, you know, that have gotten hurt already talking about the reason why they got hurt is because they took away the sticky stuff in midseason. Now they got to try to find another way to grip the baseball and it's just not working for them. But I do think it's a problem. I think baseball did exactly what it needed to do to try to correct this problem. And now it's up to uh, baseball to continue to police it. And it's up to the players to try to make sure that and the pitchers, uh, they do the, the necessary things not to get caught in cheating. And right. you were and you worried you you weren't a good talker. I mean, listen, <laughs> Rod, I, I we want to thank you for coming on the show because it's been Are great. Are we over already? We'll have you back. But sure. listen. Here's the thing I wanted to say. You're you're not you're not talking above our audience. We have a deep dive audience. We love it. Oh, 
So this this is great, and and to have somebody as as uh, gifted as you have been in so many different areas and so knowledgeable about the game is just a great great pleasure. Tony, you have anything to say as we of course. wrap up here? Because you do and the Rob, closing. You know, you know, growing up in Santa Monica, and you know, it was an honor to watch you know great athletes like yourself. And like I said at the beginning, you are someone that I've always idolized, and and, and you know, one day carry myself after and. Uh, and, and to see what you have done in your career, it just means so much to me because, you know, once you're from Santa Monica, you're always from Santa Monica. And, <laughs> and, and, it, and I tell guys all the time, Ross will tell you, I brag and tell them about we have so we have backups for backups. That's the kind of talent we have there. And uh, yeah, it's just yeah. been an honor, man, to uh, just watch you just just grow in your career. And uh, I just want to thank you for everything, man. All right. Well, thank and you. please thank come you. back on our show. We have to have you no. back. No, I'll come back for sure. I'll come back for sure. But 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 I'm proud of you too because of what you've been able to do. Because it's sometimes not easy to get out of the neighborhood. Sometimes mm-hmm. there's a lot of guys that are still there, guys that were afraid to leave. But the guys that leave, in my opinion, are some of the guys that grow because you kind of get away. You get away from your friends. You get away from that comfort zone, and you get into a whole different stratosphere. Mm-hmm. And you've done that too because you've created a, a, your movies. You're you're doing all kinds of things. So uh, I, I'm glad that I that you've looked up to me, and I'm I'm glad that I was a role model for you. Well, thank you, man. I don't bring tears to my eyes, but thank you. (laughs) Thanks so much, Rod. This was awesome.